Amen and amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God is good. He is a good God, a gracious God. The trumpet is being blown. You know for what? Repent, repent, repent. <laughs> That's the call of God. That is the call of God. Last Sunday, last Sunday we uh, opened the book of Joel. We started a, a study in the book of Joel. And uh, the very first message that came to us was, you know, what are we to do in unprecedented uh, times of, you know, disasters in a nation or in a family, in a personal life? What are we to do? What are we to do? God calls us to lament. God calls us to lament because the disasters are coming and some of us have gone through the, those and they are yet coming, you know. When God is not given that proper place in a person's life, God has his ways of getting your attention. That's what exactly he does. He has his ways of getting our attention. This is what he's doing in the book of Joel. You know, he calls everyone to lament, everyone to repent. This was a, this was a real unprecedented calamity that came upon Judah. The people of Judah went through all this calamity and suffering. Awful locust invasion has come over Judah. And then God calls everyone. The first, five, first six, seven verses in the first chapter calls everyone, repent, lament, come back to me. I want your attention. That's what God is saying. I want your attention. So he has his ways of getting our attention. He sends this locust. It was not the, it was not the problem of locusts that came and swept through the land. But it was the anger of God. You know, that is what we learn here. The anger of God came upon the nation, came upon the people of God, came upon the unbelievers, came upon everybody. The anger of God. The anger of God came upon the people in the form of a locust plague. This is dangerous, isn't it? We worship a God who cares, who loves, and who calls for our attention. Well, if you don't, and if I don't, and if you don't, pay attention to this. Worse things may come. Worse things may come and they will come and overtake us. There is no way that you and I can escape from this. Worse things will fall upon the people, those who neglect God. Those who take God lightly. A lot of people, a lot of Christians, this is the way that they are behaving and this is the way that they conduct their spiritual lives. They don't care for God. They cry out only when they are in need. Only, only when they are in need, only when they are in chaos in their lives, then only they cry out to the Lord. This is not what God wants. God wants to get involved in everything in my life. As you, get, as you wake up in the morning and until you go back to bed and even right throughout your sleep, God is at work. God is working. So chapter 1 told us that there was a time of national disaster, indescribable pain and suffering for people. And God wanted the attention of people. That's what we learned in the first few uh, verses of the first chapter. Now today, today we are going to read from chapter 1 verses 13 through 20. 13 through 20 is the of the word for us today. Let's read the scripture. And pay attention to it as we read it. Put on sackcloth, you priests, and mourn, wail, you who minister before the altar. Come, spend the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God. For the grain offerings and drinks offerings are withheld from the house of your God. Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Summon the elders. 
and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord. Your God. And cry out to the Lord. Alas, for that day, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like a destruction from the Almighty. Has not the foot been cut off before our eyes? Joy and gladness from the house of our God. The seeds are shriveled, shriveled beneath the, beneath the clods. The storehouses are in ruins. The granaries have been broken down. For the grain has dried up. How the cattle mourn. The herds mill about because they have no pasture. Even the flocks of sheep are suffering. To you, O Lord, I call. To you, O Lord, I call. For fire has devoured the pasture in the wilderness and flames have burnt up all the trees of the field. Even the wild animals pant for you. The streams of water have dried up and fire has devoured the pasture in the wilderness. This is the word of the Lord. May the good Lord bless these words into our hearts and bring fear upon us through that the wisdom to live this life, to number our days and to live for Christ and live for the Lord God who delivered us, who gave us life and who has promised us eternal life. O oh Lord, to you I cry out. We have all been in a position where we wanted to blame someone else when really the blame should have been on us, isn't it? Yeah. We we'll make excuses, have long explanations, because at the end of the day, we want to shift the blame to something or someone else. That's exactly what people want to do. That's what I want to do. That's what you want to do. We don't want to accept the blame for anything. Because accepting responsibility and blame often means admitting that you were wrong. <laughs> we live in a society, we live among people that encourages denial, blame shifting. They encourage denial and they encourage blame shifting. Admitting that you were wrong is never easy for anybody. And confessing your sin to God and others is even harder. You do something wrong for your brother, your sister, and to say sorry, it's not easy, is it? It is not easy. It's a hard thing. But it's foundational, my friends. It's foundational to the Christian life. You have to repent and place your faith in Christ in order to be a Christian. No other way that you can be a Christian. But repentance, you know, doesn't end there. It doesn't end there. The Christian life is a life of repentance. We as members of the church must separate ourselves from the world by being a people that repents easily, sincerely, and often. We need to do that. That's what God requires of us. Repent. Repent and ask God's mercy and his grace every day in and out. This is what God requires of each one of us. Oh Lord, to you I cry out. Joel chapter 1, verse 13 to 20 that I read to you this morning. Teach us a few lessons about repentance, about how to be a penitent. Teaches us a few lessons. The first that I want to talk to you is the true worshippers ought to repent personally. The personal repentance. You know? And you cannot stop at that. You repent personally and take it to your family and you repent as a family. Bring it to your church and you repent as a, as a church. Take it to the nation. And you repent as a nation because we have failed. 
We have failed God. Repentance is not easy, no? It's not easy. Personal repentance. Then secondly, what I want to bring to your notice is the, is the corporate repentance. If you are a true worshipper, you ought to repent personally. And if you are a true worshipper, you ought to repent as a community. Corporately. Genuine believers repent corporately. Are you a genuine believer? <laughs> or are you a blame shifter? <laughs> That's what we need to understand. Then finally, you repent personally, you repent corporately, and then it's not enough, you repent and you return to the Lord. That's the message today. We have to return to the Lord. True worshippers ought to repent personally. You know, you remember Jonah's story? What did Jonah do? <laughs> Jonah did not repent. Jonah disobeyed God. Jonah went away from the Lord. And he, want, he wanted to ignore God. <laughs> because things didn't happen he, the way he wanted. That happens to us also, isn't it? When things don't happen the way that I want in the church also, that you don't, you just feel like, you know, what am I to do here? You know, I need to get out of this place. This is what exactly Jonah did. Jonah disobeyed. Jonah ran for his life. And Jonah thought that he was winning. But you know, God followed him. <laughs> he could not escape. God followed him. Jonah chapter 3 verse 5 says, The people of Nineveh believed God's message. And from the greatest to the least, they declared a fast and put on a burlap or sackcloth to show their sorrow. Jonah obeyed. Jonah went and preached. Huh. And the people repented. People came back to God. They believed God. Ninevites believed God. 2 Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14 says, Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked and wicked ways. I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. This is the word of the Lord. For all what is happening around us, you know, partly we are also to be blamed. We are to be blamed. Because we have not behaved as Christians. We are to be blamed. We are the light. We are the salt. Isn't that what Jesus called us? The major theme that we discussed last Sunday was punishment or judgment. Okay? God is judging his people in chapter 1. And we are not told why. But as we continue our study, then we realize because they have not turned to the Lord. They have drifted away from the Lord. That's why these calamities or all these punishments, judgments came upon them. Even today, COVID situation. Just think about it. God is calling people to give him attention. <laughs> what do our people do? They continue to worship them creation. They continue to exchange the worship that belongs to Lord God to idols. To gods of their imaginations. That's what they do. So the calamity has come upon. I want to thank God. The Lord has shown his mercy and the Holy Spirit has opened our hearts to respond to him, isn't it? Yeah. And the Lord has brought us into a place where we are able to face the situations that we are experiencing now. You know, in the, in the Bible, there's a story uh, uh, in, the, in the second Chronicles chapter 16. There's a king called Asa. This king, you know, he was a very good king. Holy man. God-fearing man. But towards the latter 
part of his life, after 30 or 39 odd years, you know, he had a problem. Verse 16, Second Chronicles 16, 12 says, In the 39th year of his reign, Asa was afflicted with a disease in his feet. Though his disease was severe, even in his illness, he did not seek help from the Lord, but only from the physicians. That's happening even today, isn't it? Instead of seeking the face of the Lord, asking God's mercy and in repentance coming before him and opening your heart and ex receiving his guidance, running after physicians. King Esa failed. He failed. After being a, such a God-honoring man in his reign for 39 years, but when he had this problem, he turned away from the Lord and he wanted to seek the help. It is not wrong to see doctors and get medication and it is not wrong. That's what, not what I am saying. But leaving God and leaving God aside and you're trying to, you know, get people's help for your need. <laughs> you're sure to fail. That's what happened to Esa. King Esa experienced this. Instead of asking the Lord's help, he turned to his physicians. He ran after them. This is happening even among the Christians. This is to teach us more about God, more about God, my friends, than about ourselves. Amen. That's what this chapter is talking to us. Learn about God and his ways. The locusts were understood as the instrument of God's judgment, God's punishment. That's how God punished these people. Locusts were the instrument. The locusts destroyed their crops, which created a famine and killed their livestock. But really it wasn't the locusts that destroyed everything, but it was God. Do we see it in that? God was against these people because they were seeking everything else other than God. That was the reason why God got angry. That was the reason why God sends locusts to destroy everything. They needed to pray. They needed to pay careful attention to Joel's prophetic warning, but they didn't. They were experiencing the wrath of God through the locust plague in this. That's what we see. But God will often increase the severity of his judgments of punishments in order to draw people back to himself, my friends. Are you going through troubles, situations in life? Pay attention to God. <laughs> God is calling on you calling on you. How will we respond to God when we are cornered and when we are troubled and when we are faced with situations of life? How will we respond to God's judgments? Will we respond in anger and refuse to repent? Or will we repent for our unconcern and disregard towards the Lord? I think the latter thing, what I said, is the thing that we are supposed to do as Christians. <laughs> For Judah, this was not the end of their problems. This was just the beginning of it, you know. <laughs> more to come, more to come. That's why God said, repent and come back. Return to worship. Come back to the gathering, personally, corporately. When this calamity came, when God's punishment and judgment came, every area of their lives were affected by God's punishment. Every area. Look at some of the verses in chapter 1. Verse 5 says, The drunkards were called to mourn. Okay? We talked a lot about it that day, so I don't want to spend time on that. People were to mourn in verses 8 and 9. Farmers were to mourn 
in verses 11 and 12. Priests were to mourn in verse 13. Then in verses 15 to 20, there is the lament itself. Lament itself. Low society to mourn. Agricultural communities to mourn. Along with all the people, including the religious community, everyone is to mourn. So the people of God were forced to answer this question. They were forced. How are we going to respond to God's judgment? What are we going to do? Friends, it reminds, it reminds me about that verse that I told you from Second Chronicles chapter 16, King Asa's situation. Instead of turning to the Lord, he turned to the physicians. He was experiencing the judgment of God in his feet. The disease in Asa's feet was the instrument of God's judgment as he continued to ignore God and turn to the things that he, his disease got worsened. It got worsened. There is a very strong parallel here with Joel 1, 13 to 20. Strong parallel. The people of God were just discovering the disease in their feet, so to speak, and they needed to repent. They needed to repent of their sin, turn from it, and return to the Lord. They needed to recognize their sin. You know, when you read uh, verses 13 through 20, you will notice that the word repentance is not mentioned there. It's not there. Neither is a phrase like confess your sin in there. Or something along those lines. But there are signs of repentance in verse 13 to 20. Phrase is not there, but the signs are there. Signs of repentance. God through the prophet Joel tells them, put on sackcloth and lament in verse 13. Isn't that right? Verse 13. A garment of sackcloth. <laughs> not a very comfortable cloth <laughs> to put on. Not very comfortable. Not a comfortable material to put on. <laughs> sackcloth. <laughs> It was a physical sign of repentance. When people wore sackcloth, that means a physical sign of repentance. That's why even when, when we, they, were called to a repent, they were called to a fasting and prayer, he said, don't wear even the normal clothes that you wear. Put on sackcloth and come. <laughs> and not just a few hours, no, not, not just a few minutes, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. That's all we, our people can be in a meeting. Anything that exceeds an hour, my goodness, they are very restless, very restless, looking at their time and looking at them and blah, blah, blah. You know, they just want to get out of the meeting. Huh. Amazing. You must see the singular meetings that we are having. Three hours, three hours minimum. <laughs> three hours minimum. People still want to be in the fellowship, still want to ask questions, still want to grow in the Lord. What's wrong with these people today? What's wrong? I don't know. All two minutes. Do that and then they are all, they think that they have done their duty. That's it. <laughs> Put on sackcloth. Put on sackcloth. The external sign should represent what was going on, on, on in their hearts. What's going on in your heart? External signs must represent that. What's going on in your heart? Each individual needed to repent of their sin and turn from it. Not just incline to wrongdoing. Our people are going from bad to worse. Why? I don't know. No repentance. They think that they are right. But the writer here says, don't incline to wrongdoings. Return. Come back. They are not simply admitting that they made a mistake. They don't want to admit that. Repentance is expressing a deep sorrow in your soul over your sin, turning from it, and to embrace Christ. That's what true repentance is all about. God calls us to do that even today. He calls us. I also find it very interesting that the priests and the ministers were the ones that are told to lead the people in repentance. But they themselves are not repenting. 
<laughs> but they want to lead people. Joke is dead. It is a joke. Ministers were the ones to lead the people into repentance, but they are not repenting. The misery and discomfort they felt on their skin from the sackcloth is what they should have felt in their penitent hearts. That discomfort. If they had only felt that in their hearts, they would truly repent and they will tear their hearts and they will they'll rip open their hearts and they'll come to the Lord and ask his forgiveness. There's a clear implication from verse 13. The people of God couldn't even give an offering to the Lord because their land had been completely devastated by locusts. Completely devastated. All they could do was wail and cry out to the Lord. Has the weight of God's hand ever been so heavy upon you that all you could do is simply wail and cry out to him? Sin is what drives us away from the Lord. Isaiah chapter 59, beautiful two verses. Isaiah 59 Verses 1 uh, and 2. Sin is what drives us away from the Lord. Dear friends, pay attention. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull, dull to hear. But your iniquities, my iniquities, have separated us from our God. Our sins have hidden his face from us so that he will not hear us. He will not see us. His hand is not shortened. Arm is not shortened. It is our sin. It is our sin that has separated us from the Lord. That chasm that was created between man and God. Our hearts. Is your heart hardened toward God? Is your heart hardened towards God? Repent and turn back to the Lord. That's the call of God today through the scripture. Not only does God desire individual to repent, at times he desires corporate repentance. Corporate repentance is another important aspect. That's the second thing that I want to bring to your notice on this day. True worshippers, number one, is ought to repent personally. Number two, true worshippers or the believers repent corporately. Genuine believers repent corporately. Believers need to repent corporately. In verse 14, that's what we read here. Verse 14. Declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly, summon elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God. And cry out to the Lord. Cry out to the Lord. Corporate repentance. That's what verse 14 says. Joel tells them that they need to gather a solemn fast for all the inhabitants. They needed to include everyone in, in this fast. Young, old, and everybody were asked to come. Like in, in Nineveh. Everybody from the king to the smallest child, and even the animals, <laughs> fasted for three days. They began a fast, and the Lord relented, the Bible says. When you fast and pray, and when you return to the Lord in repentance, you know what happens? God relents. <laughs> All what he has intended, he will stop. <laughs> God is a, such a good God. This fast was to imply a way for the entire nation to stop all regular activities, acknowledge God's judgment and repent. They needed to recognize that it's only God that sustains them, not their food. It's the God of all creation that allows crops to yield. It is not the sun, water, or the soil. God creates the circumstances that allow crops to grow, my friends. That's why the locust plague was so such a big deal in this. It is the Lord who gives you strength to do your work. You know that? Amen. Acknowledge him with that. 
It is the Lord who is responsible for all that. It was God's judgment that they needed to repent as a nation. Does a corporate fast contradict Jesus' words of fasting in secret? No. This was a corporate uh, repentance that was called upon the nation. And as a nation, they cannot fast in secret, right? <laughs> so they have to come up. There is no contradiction. It has always been, it is always a repentance. When you talk about repentance, it's always, always been about your heart, my friends. About your heart. It's not, a, not about your external works, but it is the internal heart that matters to God. Why are you fasting? Are you fasting? <laughs> or feasting always? What is the motive behind your fast, when, if you fast? Now once a week we have on Tuesday, we have a prayer and fasting time. On Tuesdays. So if you are joining the Tuesday morning stud, uh, study and we discuss these scriptures that we have studied today further and we spend time discussing fellowship and prayer and testifying. We do all that. What is the motive behind our fast? Joel 1.14 it's about acknowledging God's judgment and expressing repentance. The fast that Joel was calling the people to would have been very sincere. It was not just a call, but a very sincere call. He's warning against self-exalting motivation for fasting. That's why Jesus said, when you fast, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. That's why we are warned against a self-exalting motivation for fasting. We are not to show other people that we are doing it. But we are to do it from our hearts. Heart is the thing that matters. John Piper, he wrote a book on fasting called A Hunger for God. And uh, in it, he mentioned something beautiful like this. Jesus is testing the reality of God in our lives. Do we really have a hunger for God himself or a hunger for human admiration? Or how easy it is to do religious things if other people are watching? How easy? Preaching, praying, attending church, reading the Bible, acts of kindness and charity. They all take on a certain pleasantness of the ego if we know that others will find out about them and think well of us. It is a deadly addiction for esteem that we have. This is what John Piper says about fasting. Beautiful uh, phrases, no? The people of God were fasting in, fasting in response to the locust plague here. God wanted them to repent of sin and return to him. We see a direct connection between the Old Testament and even the New Testament when you come to this. The New Testament church is a fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham to make his uh, posterity as numerous as the stars. That was the promise that God gave Abraham and that is what being fulfilled in the New Testament church. That's why Galatians 3 reminds us. Galatians 3 verses 13 and 14. You can make a note of that. So if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offering. Heirs according to his promise. That's what the Bible reminds us. He redeems us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles. Through Christ Jesus. So that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. So here the Bible reminds us this morning, we are Abraham's children. If you are a believer in Christ, then you are one of Abraham's true offspring. So why am I telling you all this this morning? Well, if, if, it, is, uh, if it was appropriate for all of, us, all of Judah to repent, 
then my point is then it is appropriate for, all, for, the, for the collective church to repent. That's my point. It is not only personal. As a family, as a church, as a nation, God calls people to repent. That's the call of God for us this morning. Churches, both individual congregations and entire denominations, they are to fall on their face and seek the Lord. I know you know, I'm in some of these groups and they are, they, are, they, are, they are organizing fasting and prayer times and right throughout the week we have a lot of uh, you know, activities. Praying and getting together and leaders in Colombo, you know, and most of the leaders in Colombo, they are getting together. Hope for the nation is what they have called it and people are called in for that to pray and fast and repent on behalf of our sins and on behalf of the nation. Because all these calamities that have taken place, the best thing to do is to seek the face of the Lord during this time. Spend more time with him personally. Spend more time corporately. Come to the fellowship. That is where you get the burden. That is where you are moved to do good works. <laughs> That's what Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 reminds us. It was appropriate for all of the church to repent. Appropriate. All of the individuals and congregations to come together. Not giving up meetings together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Don't give up meeting together. Some are doing it. In the habit of doing it there, some of them. They're in the habit of doing it. They don't care. They only want a Sunday meeting. Some people don't, don't want even a Sunday meeting. We have 21 meetings. <laughs> Not only Sunday meetings. So you are invited. It's all up to you. But we enjoy, we experience the mighty hand of the Lord and we encourage and we ask you also to come. The more you sit at his word, the more transformed you become. That's what God wants us to be. If we are willing to turn from our wicked and evil ways to the truth of God, I'll tell you, the Lord hears your cry then. Psalm 123 and 124, all about repentance. There we read, So our eyes look to the Lord our God till he has mercy on us. Psalm 123 and 124, both Psalms. So our hope is that when you read words like those, you will consider the sin in your own life. The sins you committed over the last week, the sins you have committed in your life so that we can repent as a corporate body when you come. Sometimes we read a more explicit confession of sin and assurance of pardoning grace to give us an opportunity to confess our sin individually and corporately. Corporate worship, corporate repentance is very, very healthy for a Christian. Don't neglect, don't give up on these. All believers, when they stray from the Lord, need to repent and then to come back. True worshippers ought to repent personally. Verse 13, we studied. Genuine believers repent corporately. Verse 14, we studied. And I want to get to the third point and close. The honest disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ repent and they return to the Lord. Individually, family, church, nations. They come corporately, individually. They return to the Lord. Believers need to repent and return to the Lord, friends. Verses 15 through 20, that's what we are told. Alas for that day, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like a destruction from the Almighty. That's why we are called to repentance. In verse 15, immediately confronted with the phrase of the, the day of the Lord. <laughs> that comes there. This phrase is mentioned many times in the prophetic literature, but it occurs most frequently in the book of Joel and in the book of Zephaniah. Very often it is mentioned. 
the day of the Lord. Joel was warning the people because the locust was simply a taste of the day of the Lord. Now the day of the Lord is a period of time, you know, from the first coming of Christ to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the day of the Lord. You never know when it's going to happen. A most severe judgment was approaching just around the corner for the people of Judah. That's why Joel is, Joel is warning them. The day of the Lord is coming. Worse things are going to happen. Watch out. Watch out. What exactly the day of the Lord is? The day of the Lord is a day that brings devastation to the wicked, but deliverance to those who turn to God. That's the day of the Lord. Complete annihilation. Complete destruction to the unbeliever. Those who reject Christ. Those who turn away from his grace. Total destruction. Nothing can save them. That's why God calls all people to repentance. Come back. Come back to me. The day of the Lord ultimately points to a judgment by day coming for the whole world in which all will have to make an account before God. Joel goes on, goes on to reinforce this fact that the day of the Lord is near in verses 16 through 18. Has not the foot been cut off before? Our very eyes, joy and gladness from the house of our God Verse 17, verse 18. The seeds are shriveled beneath the clods. The storehouses are in ruins. The granaries have been broken down. For the grain has dried up. How the cattle mourn. The herds mill about because they have no pasture. Even the flocks of sheep are suffering. The day of the Lord. Talking about the day of the Lord. It is at hand. It is coming. So Joel goes on to reinforce the fact that the day of the Lord is near. The effects of the locust plague are everywhere now in Judah. There is nothing. Everything is taken up. Eaten up by them. Verse 18 says, even the breeze, even the beast. They groan because the fields have withered away. They don't have anything to eat. Romans 8.22 That scripture reminds us. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. The whole creation has been groaning. In verse 18 we are told that even the animals you know the animals they were, the beast, they were groaning because the fields have withered away. So the day of the Lord has an immediate fulfillment in the impending judgment on the people of Judah. So Joel is looking around at all the devastation caused by the locust and saying, look at what God has done. If we do not repent soon, the Lord will judge us more severely. That is the call of God too. That's why Psalm 28 verse 1 say. Lord, to you I call. To you I call. You are my savior. You are my rock. You are my salvation. This is what David, David's cry. To you, Lord, I call. You are my rock. Do not turn a deaf ear to me. For if you remain silent, I'll be like those who go down to the pit. This is the cry of David. In Psalm 28 verse 1. The point is obvious there. There is absolutely nowhere to turn. Joel is lamenting their terrible circumstances. The devastation is from the Lord. But only the Lord can restore it. Only the Lord can restore it. Fire was. Fire. They are talking about fire. Fire was a metaphor that describes the drought. Only the Lord is capable of restoring it all. Even the animals join <laughs> Joel's cry to the Lord, you know? Even the animals join. How about you and me? <laughs> Why would God do something like this? Why would he make things go from bad to worse for them? Because he loved them. 
He loves them. Because he wanted them to repent and to return to him. If he had just allowed, they would have gone and got themselves destroyed. So out of his love, he sends all these calamities. He allows these problems to come into our lives. Where we'll think and remember and give thanks to the Lord and meditate on his word and thank God for the situation that you are facing right now. In the, in the story of the prodigal son, you know, the son had to hit absolute rock bottom before even he considered return to father, right? He had to hit the rock bottom. Till then there was no forgiveness. There was no true repentance. A mother was talking to me the other day. The daughter had run away with another man. <laughs> and after getting everything done, the daughter is calling back the mother and saying, I'm so sorry about what I've done. I said, don't tell me about these stories. Don't tell me. Until they eat, until they begin to eat pig's food. Until they lie in pig's sty And come back to normalcy and repentance in the presence of God and ask true forgiveness from the people. Then we will forgive. We don't want all these people to come and pretend before us. No pretense. God does not accept and why should we accept them? Pretenders. They go out, they hurt people, they go out and do their thing. And at the end of their thing being done, they call back and say, I'm so sorry that happened. This is a joke. I told the mother, don't even mention that to me again. You just face it. Ask God's strength. Don't get caught to this. Crocodile tears. Crocodile tears. <laughs> That's what it's called. Kimbul Kandulu. <laughs> Kimbul Kandulu. <laughs> In the prodigal story, until this fellow hit the absolute, absolute rock bottom, <laughs> he didn't come to his senses. He was even considering eating even pig slop. Then only that he realized, you know, how much food I have in my father's house. What have I done here? He repented. With a broken heart, he came. Shouldn't we allow things like that to happen? Or should we allow people to take advantage of us? He said to the father, he came back and he said to the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven. I have sinned against God. And I have sinned against you. And then, of course, the father forgave and, you know, he was restored again. Where do you turn when you, when you, when things are going from bad to worse? Where do you turn to? You want to turn to physicians like Asa did? Or you want to turn to God and ask God in repentance? Do you expect the government to do something about this situation that we are experiencing today in COVID? Government cannot do a thing. They are helpless now. But we continue to pray for our leaders and the government. We continue to pray. They are helpless now. We pray that the true repentance will come upon them. The Holy Spirit will convict them of their sinful and wicked ways. There is no way that we can expect education to fix all our problems or we experience in this world. Even though the teachers are fighting today, <laughs> Asking for their rights. They cannot fix what's going on in this world today. They cannot fix. <laughs> Do you have to wait till you hit rock bottom before you call out to the Lord and return to him? Do you? Is that what you are waiting for? <laughs> How many of you want to hit rock bottom now? <laughs> before you call on him. Before you return to him. How many of you want to do that? I don't want to. I'm sure you also don't want. One day every knee will bow. And every tongue confess that Jesus is the Lord. And they will obey. And they will come under his control. And come under his rule. 
It is very easy for us to say, yeah, I want to repent. But it is a very difficult thing to do. It is a difficult thing to do. C.S. Lewis says, his mere Christianity even said, now repentance is no fun at all. It is something much harder than merely eating a humble pie. It, it means unlearning all the self-conceit and self-will that we have been training ourselves into for thousands of years. To unlearn, it's not easy. Repentance is to unlearn, it's not easy. These are C.S. Lewis says, another scholar, it means killing part of yourself, undergoing a kind of death. Killing. Are you willing to kill a part of yourself? Jesus demanded repentance. In Luke's Gospel chapter 13, Jesus says, unless you repent, you all will likewise perish. He isn't simply speaking of the body, bodily death, but he's talking about the eternal torment in hell. What's fascinating about Jesus' demand of repentance is that it's only because of him you and I are able to repent today. There's no other way. Only by the blood of Jesus Christ that you are able to repent and stand before God, uh, stand before God, stand before a holy God guiltless. Only through the blood. Without Jesus, there isn't even an opportunity for repentance and forgiveness. Have you repented for your sins and turned to Jesus Christ? If you're a believer, when was the last time that you truly repented of your sin to the Lord? This is the gospel message that we hear. And it's for the unbelievers and also for the believers alike. Every Sunday is an opportunity for you to be awakened to the gospel, isn't it? Yeah. When our Lord... Our Lord Jesus Christ, you know, said, repent, repent. In the 15th century, Martin Luther, famously, famous uh, Martin Luther, he nailed 95 theses on the Wittenberg door in that cathedral. The first one read, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. The Christian life is marked by repentance, regular repentance to God and others. But repentance isn't merely admitting you are wrong. It's a deep sorrow within your soul and turning to Christ. Not easy, no? It is not easy. In many ways, repentance makes the Christian life so different from that of the world's values. The world values power, strength, confidence. But the Lord values repentance, forgiveness, and humility. That's what God values. World values, strength. World values, power. World values, confidence. <laughs> so they have a lot of uh, formulas to be strengthened, to be powerful, to be, you know, to have confidence. They have a lot of formulas. But the Lord Jesus Christ, our God, who is full of mercy, he values repentance, he values forgiveness, he values humility. How different is that in our current situation and the countries that we live in and the cultures that we live in, how different it is. What kind of influence could the church have in the world if you and I were more willing to glorify God through repentance and a posture of humility? How much God can do? Through repentance, our relationship with God is restored. Through repentance, our relationship with one another is restored, isn't it? Yeah, when you are repenting. When you don't repent, it doesn't come. You will have to suffer as a result of that when it doesn't come. Does God mean anything to you? Do you hear him call to repentance? May you and I repent easily, sincerely, and often. That's the call of God for you and me. So today we've seen that we are to humbly to cry out to him for deliverance. Three things we studied today. True worshippers ought to repent personally. Genuine believers are to repent corporately. Honest disciples of Christ are to repent and return to the Lord. May the good Lord bless the reading of his word and understanding his word. 
You know, the good news is Jesus Christ has brought forgiveness to you and me. Pouring out a blessing upon God's people. Jesus entered into the suffering that you and I need to. He has taken away our guilt by his death. He is the one who stood between us and the judgment. Day of the Lord has already occurred to us in Cal at Calvary. Receive it. Our sins were all judged on the cross. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, <laughs> you are free from judgment. God has released you. But now you have to live a life of repentance. Live a life of repentance. Cry out to the Lord because the Lord reigns. He hates and he judges sin. He uses disaster to get people's attention. So we have to stop everything and cry out to him before the day of the judgment arrives in a person's life. If you have not known the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm talking to you. Open your heart to the Lord and commit, confess your sin and let the Lord be the Lord of your life. If you humbly cry out to him, definitely he's going to live, deliver you. Father, we thank you for the exhortation that we received this morning. For the word of the Lord that stirred our hearts this morning. Lord, I repent. And we repent as a church. We repent as a family. We repent as a nation this morning. And we want to come back to you. Lord, we know if we don't do that, there are further things are coming to get our attention. You need our attention. Your call is to bring us into repentance. Hallelujah.